In general, people do not realize the blackness of Argentina, the blackness of Peru, the blackness of Bolivia, the blackness of Ecuador, the blackness of Venezuela, the blackness of Panama. People do not realize how black Latin America is. People, people in America, in the U.S., do not know that there are 150 million Afro-Latinos, Afro but Latinos do not know that either. The first thing out of her mouth was, I could have yelled at me in Espanol the other day. Of the 540 million people who live in Latin America, over 150 million are of African descent. The terms Latino or Hispanic, as used in the United States Census, refers to a person of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American, or other Spanish cultural origin, regardless of race. Latino is an ethnicity. According to the 2000 Census, of the 35.3 million Latinos living in the U.S. at that time, 53% identified as white, 37% identified as some other race, and 2.5% identified as black. The population of U.S. Latinos grew to 50.5 million in the 2010 census. As a child growing up in New York, uh, you know, I didn't want to associate with whiteness. I, in my family, whiteness was pretty elevated um, and celebrated. At, I feel at the expense of uh, Native American and, and African this people, people of African descent, um, and I was always very uncomfortable with that. I was always very uncomfortable with the idea that whiteness could be celebrated in such a way um, that I didn't feel when I looked in the mirror that I looked white. I mean, I didn't look like Marsha Brady. I didn't, you know, I didn't look like the white girls, you know, on you know the Babysitters Club. Whenever I saw pictures on books, you know, I. I didn't look like them, so I didn't. I could never really identify as white, even though my family identified as white. When we had the census in 2010, and it said Hispanic is not a race, you need to pick black or white, and I was very conflicted because I'm like, what do I write? Do I write black or white? And my roommate from college, she's Dominican, but she's like, you know, the first slaves who went to the Dominican Republic, so you know you're not white. You cannot write that because she's all like, you know, <laughs> stay true to your roots. And I'm like, no, I'm really conflicted. Like, my mom would be considered white, my dad would be considered black, and I don't know. And when I ask other people, like even people who are darker than me that don't look like me, they wrote white on it. And I'm like, it just feels wrong to write that. <laughs> so of course, I just like wrote it multiracial. Being Latino is complex. I mean, being Latino is so many things for so many different people. For me, like I identify with being an immigrant. I mean, but I'm also here and I identify a lot with being an Ecuadorian New Yorker, you know? So it's, it's, it's very complex and something like that, the census and, and checkboxing things doesn't uh, account for that com those complexities. I feel like America is the type of place where we feel comfortable putting people in boxes with race, sexuality, gender, anything. Like, we like to put people in boxes. And I think that a lot of Americans kind of put, um, you know, the... The, I guess Latino culture into a racial perspective when really it's not. There's no such race as Hispanic. There's no such race as Latino. It makes no sense. You know, if you're white, you're white in Argentina and you're white in America. Then it doesn't make sense that crossing the border is going to change your race all of a sudden. So if you're black in the Dominican Republic, you should be black here as well. You should be black everywhere and people should accept, all right, this is somebody of African ancestry. One can be any race and any mix of race is not Latino. But racism race politics and colorism do find a comfortable But that begs the questions. What is race? What is ethnicity? What is a Latino versus a Hispanic? One thing is for sure, all four labels are socially constructed. They get race and, I mean the question are you black is the quintessential you don't understand race and ethnicity. Um, I am black I, my ethnicity is, um, you know, Panamanian Costa Rican. Um, and it's funny because now that I've gotten older, I also won't say that I'm African American because I feel like it kind of signifies something that I'm not.
not, like when I think of African American, I think of like Southern Blacks. Um, so the connotation for me means something different. Um, but I think, I think as a society, we're still trying to figure that all out. And so people just keep getting it wrong. Um, and I think the concept of a Black Latina is still something that society's like, mm, those are two different categories. You know, that question on all the census and whatever, it's like, are you Latino? And then they put like non-white or, and you're like, wait, what's happening here? Um, I always, I still hesitate answering these questions. Biologically speaking, race does not exist. The idea and concept of race was a European created construct that is based on perceived physical characteristics and differences. Race is a power structure built on ideas of European superiority over other groups. The term ethnicity is based on the Greek word ethnos, meaning people or nation. In modern times, ethnicity refers to culture or nationality. There is a, there is a mythical aspect of racial power. There is a mythical aspect of, of ethnic power. It's not the same. Because that race is, is physical character, ethnic is cultural content, content. But both of them need this, because actually the, the notion of whiteness is also fraught by this, by this myth, you know, superiority. The term Hispanic first appeared on U.S. Census forms in 1980, after an ad hoc committee on racial and ethnic definitions decided on the term in 1975. Hispanic refers to Spanish-speaking countries of the Americas. Latino refers to the Latin-based Romance languages of Spain, France, Italy, and Portugal. It is generally used to refer to anyone of regional Latin American ancestry, including Brazil. The term Latin America was supported by the French Empire of Napoleon III during the French invasion of Mexico as a way to declare French influence in the Americas and establish a kinship to France. Part of the histories of the varied peoples of the Americas comes from enslavement, human trafficking, resistance, migration, and sexual abuse and exploitation. The mix has produced many unique forms of language, religion, traditions, customs, food, music, and dance. Indigenous people were the natives of the countries that the Spanish occupied and colonized. Slavery in the Spanish colonies started with the enslavement of the local indigenous people, but large numbers were murdered by colonists and died from overwork and disease. The indigenous populations in some countries, such as the Dominican Republic, were all but wiped out within the first five decades of the conquest. Europeos se robaron el oro, el oro en Colombia. Vinieron aquí, mataron los indígenas y se robaron todo el oro. Los españoles. The Spanish needed a new source of labor. Since the 1492 Treaty of Tordesillas, in which the world was divided between Spain and Portugal, Portugal had the exclusive right to explore and exploit all lands in the East, known as the Old World, which included Africa and Asia, and later on the region known today as Brazil. Spain had all the lands to the West, the New World, where Africans were needed for labor. Per the agreement, only Portugal could trade with Africa. So the Spanish had to buy enslaved Africans from the Portuguese or other slave traders like the British. Africans were taken to the Americas through the transatlantic slave trade. Enslaved Africans were primarily from West and Central Africa. 95% of all enslaved Africans who came to the Americas ended up in Latin America and the Caribbean. 5% to the United States. There were three categorizations of Africans in Spanish colonies. Ladinos were Spanish-speaking Africans and mixed ancestry men who were christened and lived on the Iberian Peninsula. Whether enslaved or free, they often accompanied Europeans on expeditions to the New World. Such was the case with Juan Garrido, who participated in the invasion of present-day Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Mexico. Negros Posales were those captured in Africa. The Ladino's skills and the fact that they were Christianized granted them a higher price than Bosales. 
Negros Criollos were children of Africans born in the Americas. The first purchased enslaved Africans in the New World were Ladinos sent to Hispaniola, present-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Africans and their civilizations had expertise in agriculture and metalwork Europeans needed, as well as the numbers. Africans were used to work in gold and silver mines and haciendas in the Americas. Sugar was a major cash crop. The immense wealth of Europe and the United States was amassed through slave economies. They, they arrived there from the 1500s when Spain, Portugal, England, France, depending on the country, uh, European countries uh, uh, um, traded. Um, first captured the Africans in their homes. That's why we have decided that we don't call them anymore slaves, but enslaved, because we want everybody to know that these were free people. They were teachers, they were business people, they were kings, they were nobility, they were arts people, and when they were forcefully uh, forced to be go into slavery, then they were enslaved. That was not the condition that they will accept. Actually, it has been documented the thousands of rebellions that happen among the enslaved people and the fact that they never give up their search for freedom. The Spanish and Portuguese were looking to acquire wealth through enslavement and colonization. But they were also looking to spread Catholicism and weaken Islam after hundreds of years of Moorish rule on the Iberian Peninsula to convert and civilize natives. Indigenous and Africans' freedom and their lives were contingent on their Christianity. To become Christians was to promise them freedom. And so when they were becoming Christian and swearing loyalty to the king and to the church, they were re baptized. And the Catholic Church do keep records of baptism back to those ages. So I did go in Old San Juan and go to the records of the Christian church there, the, the cathedral, and found records of my ancestors, Falus. And then we also found records of the uh, oldest ancestor that we know, which was a young man called Antonio Falou, who uh, fought with the brigade of the blacks of Santurce in Puerto Rico. When I traveled to Zimbabwe, this ambassador of Senegal saw my name and said, oh, you are from Senegal. <laughs> and then I said, no, I'm from Puerto Rico. I said, no, Falou is a very revered last name in mm -hmm. Senegal. And so I took notice of that. And then I was uh, presenting a lecture in, in a conference, and this man came and kneeled in front of me. Really? And I say, what are you doing? And he said, you are Falou. And Falou in Senegal is a sacred family because Falou was the second to Mbake. Mbake was like a Jesus Christ of the Muslims in Senegal. And Falou was the second to Mbake. We actually descend from people enslaved. Uh, so most of our surnames, I am Cordoba, for example, Mosquera. Most of our surnames obviously are from slave from masters or from, from slave masters. Generally, enslaved Africans were freed more frequently in the Spanish colonies than in the southern US. Race mixture was more common and not repressed. And the products of those mixtures were recognized as socially distinct from their parents. This mixing was the foundation for a caste system called casta a system based on the degree of acculturation to Hispanic culture, the dominant group. It distinguished between gente de razón, those who were the Hispanics, which translates to people of reason, and gente sin razón, non-acculturated natives or people without reason. The term Hispanic denoted a relationship to Spain, and it was lauded and upheld as a superior status. The Casta paintings were an early form of racism. They were pseudoscientific racial categorizations and visual representations of racial mixing produced in the Americas for Spain to view. It reinforced calidad, or quality and purity of blood. 
Travelers from Spain to the New World sometimes carry certificates of this blood purity as proof of their lineage. Mestizo is the term used for people of indigenous and European ancestry, and it translates to half-caste, signifying that believed superior European blood was degraded by indigenous, thus affecting one's caste position. Or conversely, European blood redeeming indigenous blood. African blood was viewed as unredeemable. During the colonial period, mestizos became the dominant group in many parts of Latin America. The caste of terms varied from region and across time periods, and there are many, many more terms of racial mixing. This is a general descending order. Peninsulares and criollos of Spanish ancestry are at the top. Negro is at the very bottom. Colombia has been built as a nation inspired by Spain um, in the 70s. We had these, up until the 70s, we have this notion of the criollo mestizo. Uh, and that criollo mestizo had a strong sense of identity associated with the Spaniards, I mean, the Spaniards, the Spanish left this country in some time, some little time before 1810. But they left their, they left their, their criollo generation here. And they were very loyal you know, to the Spanish queen, the Spanish crown. Entendamos cultura latinoamericana como una sola. Pero si uno se pone a ver las particularidades de cada país, entiende un poco que esa cultura latinoamericana no abarca todo el mundo. ¿Sí? Eh, me pongo a pensar, por ejemplo, en las 68 etnias indígenas, son 68 67 etnias indígenas en Colombia, más las dos afrodescendientes fuera del afrodescendiente. Esa palabra latinoamericano me lleva a replantearme qué es el latinoamericano y también cuál es el estereotipo que se ha implantado sobre el ser latinoamericano. ¿sí? Si entiendo Latinoamérica desde México hasta Argentina, eso me da una lectura demasiado mestiza, ¿sí? más que negra y más que indígena en el general, a pesar de que en la cotidianidad estas tres grandes culturas si lo quiero ver de esta manera, están en contacto con la gente. Sí, se mezclan, no me, se mezclan, pero de que hay un signo. One may not even know their full ancestry without a DNA test. Take, for example, samba dancer, singer, and composer Neguño da Beja Flor stage name of Luis Feliciano Antonio Neguño. From looking at him, one would think he is of majority African descent. Not so. He is 31.5% African ancestry, 67.1% European ancestry, and 1.4% Amerindian ancestry. DNA tests were conducted by the geneticist Sergio Peña, Professor of Biochemistry at the Federal University so of well, Minas Gerais. That from a uh, genetic or a biological standpoint, the races do not exist. They're just ways of dividing humanity. They are convenient for social and political uh, uh, means. These are the DNA results of other well-known Brazilians. Even with large quantities of mixed people, which is not unique only to the Americas, and the indoctrination to convey a mythical hormone mestizaje, and the current rising trend of ancestry tests, historically, the white ruling oligarch classes were alarmed by growing non-white populations 
and try to stop this through blancamiento policies, immigration policies, eugenics, and targeted campaigns to kill off or breed out non-European peoples and descendants to this day. The Latin American racial hierarchy still maintains white supremacist pathology to order society, propped up by anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. Real and material lived experiences outweigh blood quantum. Ya, vamos. Ellos sí son de aquí, de la capital. Ellos no son sinónimos de peligro. Ellos no representan el peligro para los ciudadanos. ¿Por qué ellos no los detienen? ¿Por qué no los detienen a ellos si a nosotros sí? Viene el pasado, cada cinco minutos van de 200 personas. Y escoge exactamente a los dos negros que vienen pasando para requisarles. Y los detiene. Y asume una actitud grosera ante nuestra persona. Y claro, somos iguales ante la ley, somos iguales ante la ley, pero yo escojo cara para decidir a quién requiso y a quién no. Claro, ¿por qué no requisas a los otros? Porque ahí está. Pero es un país donde somos iguales, donde los negros y los blancos son iguales ante la ley. Esa es la representación de la ley. A ver, ¿a quién más está deteniendo? ¿A quién más está parando a requisar? Son las 7, 8 de la mañana. Es normal que lleve prisa. Pero mi prisa sí es sospechosa. La, so la prisa de ustedes no es sospechosa porque ustedes son ciudadanos. Es por esa es la diferencia. Es eso lo que me molesta. Que este hijo de puta país hipócrita que nos ha tenido a nosotros los negros haciendo una enorme contribución a la construcción de la nación no respeta nuestra humanidad. Es eso lo que me molesta. In Brazil, there are over a hundred color descriptors. Hair texture and phenotype also plays a huge role in one's color descriptor. Latin America never followed the U.S. one drop rule, which is hypodescent, where people of mixed ancestry were assigned to the subordinate group. The reverse was true in the practice of hyperdescent. The regla de sacar, o gracias a sacar was where a person of mixed ancestry could be considered legally white, part of the dominant group, if they could prove that at least one person per generation in the last four generations had also been legally white. Whiteness being a social, political, and economic status to be attained, even to present day. We have different kinds of people in my family. We have people who are really, really dark, and we have people who look really, really Asian, and then we have other people who look really, really white blonde hair, green eyes, you know, in fact, that's one of the things that gets touted, you know, in my, in my family history on my father's side is that I have a grandmother who was blonde hair and green eyed. Does the African ancestry or indigenous ancestry, does that get degraded in favor of touting the Italian and the Spanish? I wouldn't say that it was degraded. I think that it's more erased. Um, it's not talked about. Uh, and I think that this has to do for a couple of reasons. One, you know, um, is obviously, you know, being able to align yourself with whiteness and, and, and um, receiving the privileges that come along with that. Finding your native grandmother or your black grandfather is not, a, is not something that you are looking for, right? You're looking for whiteness. You're looking for some kind of way to um, alleviate your own oppression and often that means a history of whiteness it's, it's just that's just the, the way that Latin Americans work so it's to align yourself with the oppressors then I would say so yeah because again you know what does that mean you know it means you know better job opportunities it means that you're fa you're not supposed to be here you're not supposed to be poor you're supposed to be you know you were once in Europe and 
you were once, uh, you know, someone who had status, right? La raza. When you say raza, it's not in the United States sense of race. It means power, it means status. Um, so to come from raza pura is, is something, it's not in the way that we think of it in terms of biological terms, but, you know, in, in Latin America, and, you know, it means, it means something of status. It's really about climb the classes. Ultimately, that's the biggest discrimination though. High status and whiteness go hand in hand and is expressed in the term negro lavao, which means clean black. The idea that money whitens and one can transcend a low racial classification through high economic means. Color and class are inextricably linked. They come to go over the class system. So we are, we are in Colombia, we are kind of uh, lingering between you know, class and race, class and race. Historically in Latin America, um, you, racism doesn't exist, right? Um, so they, the, this idea of la raza cosmica, this idea of mestizaje, um, I think has done an interesting, um, ha has affected our Latin American psyche in an interesting way. Um, in the sense that we will say that we're not white, but we also won't say that we're black. I think that trying to recognize that we're not just white is obviously a positive thing. Um, I think that it elevates, uh, you know, uh, uh, an invisible history. However, I, you know, in in claiming now that you are of native ancestry, you know, you're also sort of erasing your African one. I mean, where in mestizaje do we talk about um, being Africana? I mean, where in mestizaje do we discuss? I think that more recently scholars are starting to understand it as sort of a mixture. But really, mestizaje meant a mixture of white and Native American blood. It didn't mean, you know, a, a mixture just of anyone. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that that I think that there are consequences to mestizaje that we have yet to really fully explore, and one of them being um, sort of uh, our pull away from blackness. The establishment is covered. It's not. It's not bold enough to face the question of race. There's no, there's virtually no racial debate in Colombia. So it's very easy to just go the easy way and say, you know, we're, we're a, mixed, a mixed nation, a mestizo, and that's it, that's the end of the discussion normally. So most people in general think, yeah, racial issues are a non-issue. No issues, they, they, they don't matter. This idea of, the, of Latinos as a cosmic voice, right? So we're all together, so we're all cool, so we can't really complain about anything. So for a while, I think a lot of people were like, okay. And I think then a lot of people noticed, well, no, you don't treat me the same, so obviously we're not in the same cosmic race together. So I think that's one reason. I think that people are realizing, no, I deserve equally, I deserve equality. Regardless of if we're in the brothers or whatever. The second wave of creators, they, were, they didn't call it San Criollo, but they were mestizos. So this country claims that it's mestizo. This country, a mestizo basically means that it's a mixture of races. And they claim that this mixture of races um, cures every racial con confrontation or racial. Uh, conflict or even class conflict, which is not true. I think, on the contrary, this mestizo notion preserves racial divides and class divides. But most Colombians are very happy to be the whitest possible, the less mestizo, mestizo possible. That is, uh, the less Indian blood they have, they have in themselves is better for them. And the higher they are in the, in the class structure is better for them. So you actually have a very hierarchical class, uh, uh, system, social system in Colombia, 
which is also associated with a with a racial hierarchy. What I found very interesting, given my own um, background, being from the Caribbean, uh, where there are so many sort of visible people of African ancestry, is to learn so much more about Central America um, and the way in which. There are strong pockets of African identity in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Mexico, um, and that they have to fight against a, a different form of the Latin American um, racial ideology, where there's a notion of mestizaje, like you know, everybody's mixed and it's wonderful, but it's what um, another scholar calls monocultural mestizaje, when the idea is just that it's just Indians and Europeans who are part of the mixture and black is completely invisible. Um, th that was a very sort of revealing um, part of, for me as a researcher in this project, uh, to see the ways in which across the Americas, even with those distinctions and the, and the de demographic differences, that the plight could still be so the same that the lack of access to education could still be the same, you know, that being a few exotic others in Bolivia doesn't change the way in which blackness is perceived as a problem. You could just be somebody in a favela in Rio and you'd still have that same problem. Colombia is considered to have the third largest African descent population in the Western Hemisphere, after Brazil and the U.S. The Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Puerto Rico follow Colombia with large African descended populations in Latin America. The United Nations General Assembly pronounced 2011 as the year of people of African descent. 2012 to 2022 is the decade of people of African descent. People of African descent, Afro-descendants, are acknowledged in the 2001 Durban Declaration and Program of Action at the UN's Third World Conference Against Racism as a specific victim group who continued to suffer racial discrimination and human rights violations as the historic legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. My problem is that they want us to embrace the European um, only, and it's like the indigenous culture is so rich and so vibrant and so real and it's so there in our lives. The African root is so part of our lives because Santeria, dancing, look at our moves, look, play some congas, throw some Celia Cruz up. <laughs> An hour from the historical slave port of Cartagena in Colombia is a maroon town established by runaway enslaved Africans, also known as Cimarones. Here in the town 
Square of San Basilio de Palenque in the statue of Vegas Biobo, a former African king of what is known today as Guinea Bissau in West Africa. He and 10 other slaves escaped from the port of Cartagena and led a successful slave revolt sometime in the 16th century. Como le decía, es esta calle que vemos aquí en forma horizontal, la calle central de San Basilio de Palenque. In San Basilio de Palenque, Palenqueros have preserved their African roots and have an Afro-Latino culture, speaking a language that is a mix of African Bantu languages and Spanish. Cuando un esclavizado recuperaba su libertad, se iba a los bosques, se iba a otros lugares y fundaba lugares donde vivía que le llamaban palenques, pero a esos esclavizados que se fugaban les llamaban cimarrones. This free town is just one example of the many palenques and the Brazilian equivalent quilombos that exist in the Americas. She pulled me to the side and she was like, if you want to see people that look like you, make sure you go to the We mean white, uh, white washed in the construction society, our roots get lost. And that's, that creates the problem of identity. Because if we, we are in a, in a nation which is led by, if you like, white mestizos, so they keep reminding us that we're black, that we're not like them, you know. So, there, there's, there's a racial conflict which is, is being contained all the time. Racism is, is, a, is a hell of a drug. You know, and I shouldn't just say racism, but white supremacy. You know, let's be more specific. I think that people throw around the word racism, they don't know what it means. But white supremacist values in Latin America, very strong. They're very strong. Um, and you, like I said, you could be a black queen and they may consider you better than all the other blacks. But it doesn't mean that they're necessarily um, invite you to be a part of this mestizaje. There were people like Nivardo Gomez, a guy who wrote La Raza Antioquia, the Antioquia Reigns in 1924. Or people like Luis Lopez de Mesa. I mean, they were intellect, intellectuals. So what, what, I, what I'm saying is this, what I'm saying is Antioquenos learn to be what they are from, from their intellectual elite, from their intellectual establishment, from their own local regional intellectual establishment. Some of them were very prominent, uh, like for example, um, with Lopez de Mesa. He was at some point the president of the Liberal Party, he was a senator, he was ambassador to Germany, to the Nazi Germany, 
Yeah, he was a uh, minister of minister of education. So he was a very powerful person. And there are not, I mean, a bunch of other guys like like them in Ethiopia who were all into that. I mean, I think at that, at that time in the world, the world, the entire of, uh, Western world.